If you've taken any programming theory classes recently, one of the things covered fairly early is programming paradigms. You know, object-oriented, functional, procedural, and so on. These paradigms are a way for us to structure our programs. For example, in procedural programming, you'd normally write the procedures to convert some data from form A to form B. This data is written separately from the procedures transforming them. On the other hand, object-oriented programming collects the data and stores it alongside the code operating on said data into a class. Now, I won't argue here which of these ideas is good and which is bad. Instead, I want to draw your attention to the fact that in both of these paradigms, one thing is common. The fact that data is treated as something completely separate from the code. And to be fair, this is a reasonable thought. Data is dumb, it does nothing by itself, but code actually makes the computer do something. However, to the computer, this distinction doesn't really exist. And using this fact, we can do quite a few cool things. To explore this idea, we will go through some code representations that we know of and see what we get by treating those as data. Believe me, this can get a bit complicated, but for now, let's just start super simple. Let's start by treating regular old code in string form as data. So, what can we do with this? Let's say we write a program which outputs a file, which itself is a Hello World program. This alone seems quite worthless, but the main point is that it enables a lot of automation. For example, we could write the world's worst is even function by a simple for loop. Writing the function itself by hand would take forever, but doing it via a program is much quicker. But enough of the ironic examples. For a real example, look no further than data structures. You could, say, write a meta program function which generates all the code required for a dynamic array parameterized by what type the array should store. Like here. I wrote a function which instantiates code for a hash table and just called it three times to create three hash table types instantly. No need to repeat code. Taking this further, the meta program can itself be parameterized. For example, this meta program reads a file containing a list of types for which to generate dynamic arrays for. Now, of course, more commonly, this instantiation of data structures is done with generics or templates, both of which are language-level forms of metaprogramming. But if you're using C, which doesn't have either of those, this is one way to do it. Another big example is OpenGL function loading. I'll give a quick brief on what I mean by this. OpenGL is a graphics API allowing your CPU to communicate and synchronize with the GPU, so you can draw stuff to the screen super fast. This API is provided in the form of a DLL file on Windows called OpenGL32.dll. But since it's a DLL file, you can't just call functions from it by statically linking with it. No, you have to load the DLL into memory and use the names of the functions to find the addresses where the functions are stored and then use these functions via function pointers. I've covered the details of how DLLs work in my C compilation video, but generally, to load and to be able to use any OpenGL function, you have to do a few things. 1. Define a function or function pointer type for the specific function. 2. Create a variable of said function pointer type. 3. Optionally define a macro which gives you a simple name. And 4 actually load the function from the DLL. I think it's clear that this is pretty easy to write a program for. So this is pretty much perfect for automation using a meta program. In fact, this is exactly what loaders like GLAD do. Go onto their website, select some options, and or whatever you specify, a file is generated which will load the exact functions you need. So far, I've only talked about the generative part of meta programming. We're only generating code based on some parameters, but by treating code as data, we can also inspect code and do some checking. However, this part is generally not done at string level, because there just isn't enough information for accurate analysis. Instead, we can go down to level 2, 
the AST representation. Here, on level 2, we get a lot more context about our program than at the string level. For C, we have libclang, which can pass string code into an AST. However, certain other programming languages like Jai and Nim allow access to the AST at compile time. So, what can we do with this? Well, as I said before, this allows for certain types of checking. For example, we can take a look at some standard that has been defined, like Misra, and try to validate programs according to that standard like completely disabling dynamic heat allocations by detecting calls to malloc, calloc, virtual alloc, or a map, or detecting identifiers of more than 31 characters. Pairing this with generative metaprograms means that you can do some really useful things. For example, a fairly common requirement in C is generating an array of names corresponding to some defined enum. Or another fairly common use case is using introspection to generate serialization and deserialization functions for certain structures. In that vein, you could also be able to make a meta program which looked at all the functions and if they had a particular note, would use the AST to transpile that function into valid GLSL shaders, essentially skipping GLSL and making everything in your project the same language. In the end, the only limit is your creativity and your sanity. Of course, though, we can go lower than that, down to level 3, assembly. So, what can you do when you treat assembly as data? Well, unfortunately, not much. Assembly is in this weird middle ground. It's not high level enough to provide information about a program as an AST is, nor is it low level enough that a computer can understand it easily. You're just better off going either up to the AST level or down to level 4, machine code. We're now going to be blowing some minds. Remember when I said the distinction between code and data doesn't really exist for computers? That did apply to files, of course, as in a computer doesn't inherently know what makes a .c file and a .xlsx file different. But that's not all. Remember, our computers only deal with binary, ones and zeros. The data we manipulate is stored in RAM as binary. But the code that is also being executed is also stored in RAM as binary. Now, since both these elements live in RAM, I could pose the question. Can we manipulate code in RAM as we would data at runtime? For example, could we allocate a buffer in RAM, fill it with some data that is valid code and execute that? The answer to this question is absolutely yes. And this technique is used in the technology we use pretty much every day. So let's try doing this ourselves. In a sense, we want something like this malloc a small buffer, put some instructions into that buffer, execute the code in that buffer, and then just free the buffer. Let's go over this process step by step and pin down what exactly we have to do. First of all, the allocation part. While it would be nice to be able to do this with just a simple malloc, it won't actually work. The issue is simple. RAM isn't exactly just a contiguous block of memory where you can read and write and run anywhere. It's split into pages. The size of the page depends on the operating system, but generally it's 4 or 8 kilobytes. Every page has its own permissions as well, dictating whether you can write to or read from that page. There is another permission which dictates whether you can execute code stored within said page. Malloc, by default, doesn't give you an allocation with the execute permission, so unfortunately we'll have to interface with the operating system this time. We can use virtual alloc with the page execute read write permission flag for Windows, or mmap with prot read prot write prot exec permission flag for Linux. I'm using Windows, so I'll keep things simple for the examples here. And okay, let's just replace the free with virtual free as well. Now that we have a valid block of memory to work with, let's talk about these instructions. These depend on what CPU you are using. Generally, if you're using Intel processors, you would probably be working with x86-64 machine code. 
if you're using an ARM based processor that has an entirely different instruction set. Just make sure you know what architecture you're on. Once you know this, you can look into corresponding instruction encoding schemes online. Remember, machine code is basically a translation of assembly to simple bytes. For example, the instruction move EAX ECX, that is the instruction to move data from the ECX register to the EAX register, directly maps to 89C8. Now, if you don't want to do any of this, there is still a way out for you. You can use Godboard to convert some code to assembly instructions, then use an assembler like NASM to convert these assembly instructions into bytes. Though, if you do do this manually, then you are losing what makes this technique so useful. We'll get to that, but now we know how to actually get instructions to execute in the format that we want. Right, now we have one last piece of the puzzle to solve. How do we actually execute these instructions? The answer is simple, in essence, but there's a bit of nuance to it. First of all, notice what we actually have to do. When we want to execute the code, we want to jump to the code and then return back from the code to the execution location. Doesn't that sound precisely like a function call? In fact, that's exactly what we can leverage. We have an address to where the code lives and we can use a function pointer pointing to the start of the code and just call that function pointer. That automatically has all of the mechanisms that we need. Of course, that's not going to be it. At the end of our code block, we'll also need to add a ret instruction so that we can actually return back from the call. This is just one byte, 0xc2. Now, this will work. It will execute the instruction, move eax ecx, and jump back to the call set. Obviously, we just wrote some constants to our buffer in this example, but since everything is at runtime, you can generate whatever instructions you want. But now, the question is how we bridge the gap between dynamically generated machine code and our regular C code. I mean, we are executing some instructions, but these instructions have to do something. Maybe take in some input and return some output. Well, since we are already using a function pointer, we can change the type of the function and be able to process values how we want. But then, somehow, we need to be sure to write machine code which actually uses this parameter and actually returns a result. Which means that we need to know where the parameters are and where the return value should go. This all is determined by something called the calling convention. The calling convention can differ per operating system and per language. For C, there is a different calling convention for Windows and Linux. There isn't really a strict rule here. You just need to make sure to match them correctly. Since I'm on Windows, this article here has everything documented. For Linux, an alternative is provided in the description. So, from this, I can see that the first integer argument is passed in via the ECX register and the return for an integer is done using the EAX register. So, all I need to do to implement this identity function is to move the value from ECX into EAX. That's exactly the instruction I'm using right now because I cheated to the power of a script for this video. All in all, this allows you to parameterize even the generated code, which is really, really powerful. Unfortunately, this technique is quite platform dependent, as you can probably tell by this point. We had to use the operating system to allocate the buffer, as well as know the calling convention, and we also had to know the processor architecture to actually generate the right machine code. So it's only really useful in very niche cases. What are these cases, you ask? The short answer is JIT compilers. You've probably heard of compilers which take in some code and output a binary executable. Then, to run the program, you have to run this executable itself afterwards. On the other end of the spectrum, we have interpreters which take in some code and execute it immediately by running through a virtual machine of some sort. JIT compilers exist in the middle of these two. They execute code immediately, like interpreters, but they don't use a virtual machine with fake instructions. Instead, they convert the code to machine code at runtime using this technique. This makes execution very fast due to the absence of the virtual machine. In fact, the browser you're watching this on is also a great example.
browsers need to execute JavaScript code to display web pages and play videos, and most browsers use the V8 engine, which JIT compiles JavaScript to get the best performance possible. With that, we reach the end of the stack of code representations. To conclude, I think it's clear that treating code as data is really powerful, but in the end, it's really important to not go crazy with these techniques. Yes, metaprogramming and JIT execution are very powerful, but as overused as this quote is, with great power does come great responsibility. It is really easy to get carried away when using metaprogramming, and it can absolutely hurt the readability of your code. So every time you start going down this route of using too many templates, macros, or meta layers, it's always good to take a step back and ask yourself whether it's actually worth it. That being said, that is all for this video. Thanks for watching and see you next time.